Hello, good afternoon to this talk, uh, second talk of the afternoon. And today we have Professor Hannah Markwick from University of Tübingen, and she'll be talking about counting bitangents of quartic curves, arithmetic, real, and tropical. Yeah, Hannah, please start. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation, and thanks also for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, if only virtually. You know, we can't do better than that. But uh, yeah, nevertheless. Right. Um, so I'd like to tell you about counting by tangents of quartic curves. And I'm going to uh, report on a joint work with NG Quator and with Joab Len, and also on a joint work, which partially is also still in progress with Sam Payne and Chris Shaw. And my plan for the talk is to showcase tropical geometry as a tool for simultaneous geometric counts over various fields. So what I mean by that is that in algebraic geometry, um, you know, we can work over different fields. Many of us choose to work over an algebraically closed field, such as the complex numbers, because then we have Hilbert's Nullstellensatz and somehow the world of algebraic geometry is easier. But other fields are also interesting. Real algebraic geometry is also a thing, but even yet again, other fields could be interesting, study varieties over other fields. And in particular, I care for counting problems. So uh, usual problems like you fix a bunch of points and you ask how many curves pass through these points or something like that. Um, and I claim that tropical geometry is a particularly good tool to understand such geometric counts simultaneously over various fields. And we'll get there why this works. You, you'll see that um, in this showcase um, for the case of bitangents of quartics. So the plan for the talk is that I first introduce the counting problem for us today, which is bitangents of quartics. And then I'll introduce tropical geometry as um, if I'm not wrong, then this is not familiar to everyone in the audience. So I'll try to uh, start from the basics somehow. Then we'll talk about bitangents to tropical quartics. And uh, then we'll discuss some results, lifting results. And uh, in the end, we'll get to arithmetic counts, which an arithmetic count you should view as simultaneous count over various fields. We'll discuss this. Okay, we'll start with the introduction of the counting problem by tangents to plane quartics. And this is a very classical topic. It goes back to Plücker in 1834. So, you know, more than or what, 200 years ago, right? Very, very long time. Um, and he tells us already that if we take a smooth plane quartic defined over an algebraically closed field, then it has precisely 28 bitangents. So just to set the notation and make things uh, very clear, a plane quartic you can view as an algebraic curve defined by a polynomial of degree four. Let me just write something. So this, it's a, a variety defined by a polynomial. And for simplicity, you can think homogeneous polynomial, or you can also just think for simplicity, a polynomial in two variables. Um, and we want this polynomial to be of degree four. Yeah, then it's going to be a quartic, okay. And we want the plane quartic to be smooth. So it shouldn't have nodes or cusps or something like this. This is not allowed, yeah. We want a smooth plane quartic. And then it will have uh, 28 by tangents. What's a by tangent? That's a line that is tangent in two points, right? Okay, now let's come to differences when we talk about different fields. This was, this holds for an algebraically closed field. What if we discuss the real numbers? Yeah, let's discuss a polynomial defined over the reals. And let's discuss the real vanishing locus of that polynomial. That will be a real plane quartic. Then Plücker also already tells us that we can have four, eight, 16, or 28 real bitangents, depending on the topological type of the plane quartic. So a real plane quartic can have different ovals, as we say, and it can have at most four ovals, which topologically are then somehow 
ordered like this. And we'll see a picture in just a second where you see 28 real bitangents. But if you have less overs, you can also have less real bitangents. And one notion that I want to introduce right now is the notion of totally realness. We say that a bitangent is totally real if the tangency points are also real. So a picture like that, where you actually see the tangency points in the real picture that I'm drawing, would be a totally real bitangent. But there exist also pictures where you have a line like this, and it is a real line, and it is a bitangent, but the tangency points are actually complex conjugate. So you don't see them in the real plane, which is why the, the picture looks as if the line does not touch at all, but it touches the complex part of the curve. Yeah, I'm only cutting the real part. Of course, there are also complex points that at which this polynomial vanishes, right? And and this line is now tangent at such complex points. And so this line is not totally real. This is totally real. This is totally real and this not. Okay, this is just a sketch anyway. Um, I'm going to show you some uh, real pictures now and, and real actually in, in all uh, possible understandings. So this is honestly a picture of a quartic over the reals. Uh, and it's not just a sketch, it's a serious picture. So I know, I know this is a little bit hard to see, but I hope you can make it out. This gray overs here, gray, they maybe look a little bit like, uh, like beans or kidneys, yeah? These gray parts, this is the quartic. It has four overs, as you can see. And then you see a bunch of lines and we can, or maybe we don't want to believe that it is really 28 by tangents. Um, and they are actually all also totally real because all the tangency points are real. If you're not willing to believe that these are really 28 bit by tangents, I have another picture to convince you. So yet again, in gray, the four overs of my real quartic of the example I want to look at. And the fact that the interior of those overs is shaded in blue doesn't have to say anything. That's uh, just the part of the complement of the curve, so we don't care. But what this picture is, it's so, it's so to say a part of the picture before, yeah? And what is this part? It's sort of um, discussing only the bitangents that meet one of those overs, yeah? The red one that meets, let's say, so this is somehow our reference over now, and the red one meets this and the next uh, from one side, the blue one, this, and the next from the other side, then the black one, this, and the yet again, a new oval, the orange, another oval, turquoise, the fourth oval. Um, and then we also can go from the other side of our oval to the first oval, and we have this green line which is tangent to only by tangent to the same over, right? Two tangency points at the same over. And now we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And now we all see that those are seven. And now I think we're all willing to believe that those are indeed 28 because it's sort of, you know, just symmetric. You do this for every over and then you have your 28 by tangents. Okay, this is another picture of um, a real uh, plain quartic that has 28 totally real bitangents. Yet again, 28 is somehow a little bit too big to just see it, but we could sit down and try to count, or you can just believe that this is actually uh, 28 bitangents. And that's a picture that I took from a paper by Plaumann, Sturmfels, and Vincent, where they discuss how to compute by tangents for plain quartics. A very nice paper, actually. Okay, that much about the counting problem by tangents to plain quartics. That's the concrete case for which I want to showcase how useful tropical geometry can be to discuss counting over various fields simultaneously somehow. Like, you know, for the by tangents you've seen already. For the complex numbers, you get 28, no matter how your, bi how your quartic looks like. For the reals, it depends on what precise quartic you picked. You can have 4, 8, 16, or 28, right? Okay, now let's introduce tropical geometry. 
to be able to use this tool for our counting problems. Okay, so what do we do? Tropical geometry, I want you to view this as some sort of degeneration of algebraic geometry. And since we're only discussing curves today, let's just say we degenerate complex algebraic curves. Um, and also we can just restrict to the plane and study plane curves. And then what we do is we take the points of our plane curves, which are not zero, which don't have any zero coordinates. And we apply this logarithm map, which is defined coordinate wise as logarithm of the absolute value of X and logarithm of the absolute value of Y. And uh, the, the image of my complex algebraic curve log C is what we call an amoeba. And then the, a tropical curve will be, so to say, the limit of an amoeba, where I topologically shrink the, the part of, that of, of my amoeba until I get something piecewise linear. Let's try to understand an example. Let's imagine we take a, a line, yeah? So just uh, let me write down a line equation for an example. So I have a line. It's given by some equation, you know, ax plus by plus c. I can say, or you can homogenize if you like, no matter. So that's a line in the plane. And we want to understand the image under this log map. Now it turns out that the points where the log map is not defined are somehow the most interesting points. Yeah, so my line L, it will intersect the axis, x equals zero at some point, and depends on what the coefficients here are, uh, what precisely this point is, but we'll have a point of the form zero, y zero, which is contained in this line. And at this point, the image is not defined, right? But as we move close to this point, what is happening to this image? Well, the logarithm of zero uh, gets, the, gets closer and closer to minus infinity, right? Sorry, so I said something stupid. The logarithm of zero is not defined, of course, but as we move close to zero, um, we insert smaller and smaller values and the logarithm of these very, very small values, very close to zero, tends to minus infinity, right? So the image of where we approach this point where the map is not defined will tend to minus infinity and then some fixed value logarithm of y zero. So that would be, um, it, that sort of gives me this tentacle pointing down here where I have a minus infinity, right? Then completely symmetric, I also can discuss the point where I meet the axis y equals zero. And as I move close to that point, I will obtain something that has, you know, some number here, which I don't really know precisely, and then a minus infinity in the second coordinate, right? And that gives me another tentacle of my amoeba picture. What about the third tentacle? Now it depends on how you like to view this. You can either think of your line as sitting in the projective plane, and then this third tentacle will be given by the intersection with the third coordinate axis. Or if you prefer to think dehomogenize, you can just think that if we make both X and Y be very big in the absolute value, then the difference of those two doesn't really matter so much after applying the logarithm. And for that reason, we obtain a tentacle in direction one, one, a diagonal tentacle. So I hope I could convince you that the amoeba of a line has three tentacles in those three directions. And what we can also say is that this line, when viewed as a Riemann surface, is of course just a sphere. Yeah, so it's it's real two-dimensional, it's complex one-dimensional, real two-dimensional, my line. Yeah, but then if I apply this log map, I should also expect to see something two-dimensional. Something two-dimensional that has those three tentacles. 
So you can view this as sort of, I have my three special points, those zero points in my sphere. And topologically, what I'm doing is I'm sort of producing a hole here. It's like a, a balloon. And I stitch, I, I take a needle and make three holes into the balloon. And then I take the three boundaries that I have and pull very far out. Yeah, and what's going to happen to my balloon? Well, it's uh, sort of going to look like this. And as I flatten this and map it to R2, I get this picture that you see here on the left. So that's the amoeba of a line. And then we do this shrinking process that I told you about. We look at the limit of the amoeba. So we shrink this thing until we obtain this picture on the right, which is now not two-dimensional anymore. It is one-dimensional. It's something piecewise linear. It's just a graph that has one vertex and three rays in the three directions. And this is what we want to call a tropical line or the tropicalization of a line, if you want, under this degeneration process using amoebas and this log map and then some shrinking procedure. To give you a little bit of history on context, tropical geometry was, so to say, born in 2002. Um, pioneers were Christian Michalkin and Bernd Stumfels. There was lots of previous work by many, many researchers, of course. You can, as I said, view it as a degenerate version of algebraic geometry. And one way to think of this limit of amoebas is that you actually think of a families of curves of which you take the limit. So we have a polynomial that depends on a parameter. The coefficients depend on a parameter. And then I let t tend to infinity and consider the logarithm to the base t of the vanishing locus of my curves. This is what makes this intuitive shrinking procedure that I talked about on the example in the slide before, what makes this mathematically precise. This is what will produce the shrinking from something two-dimensional to something one-dimensional piecewise linear. An alternative way to view this is to then say, okay, those coefficients a, i, j of t, which depend on t, I can view those as series in t. More precisely, preserve series is a good choice if you heard of this before. And then I can just think of my curve as a curve being defined over the field of preserve series. And if I take this perspective, then I can also think of tropicalization as the process that just takes coordinate-wise valuation of a field with a non-Archimedean valuation. So this is just a, com a comment for the experts who heard about preserve series or other non-Archimedean valued fields before. If you have not heard of this before, you can just ignore this last comment and go back to this topological point of view and think of tropicalization as shrinking amoebas. Okay. So we saw a tropicalization of a line. Um, now I hope that you are inclined to believe me that if I take a plane quartic and use the same degeneration process, I might obtain a picture like this. Why could we expect something like that? Well, we saw before that we say that we see something piecewise linear. Then one thing I should make clear, this is of course not a finite thing, those, these are infinite rays that continue forever, right? I just can't draw them forever. This is why I stopped at some point. Yeah, those are the infinite rays, which corresponded to the zeros of our line. In, in the previous example, the zeros of our line with the coordinate axis, right? Now we have a quartic, and a quartic meets a line, of course, in four points, yeah? So we are not surprised, I, I hope, that we see four such tentacles in the four special directions, which, uh, sorry, in the three special directions, which correspond to the three coordinate axis of P2. Um, also, a plane quartic is something of genus three. So we are probably also not surprised to see three holes in our graph, so to say, three cycles, you might say, right? And the rest are details, yeah? So we could sit down and take a concrete equation, for example, over the field of preserve series and really apply this formal procedure and we'll end up with such a picture. But that's a story for another talk, so to say. 
for this talk, I hope that you're all happy to just believe me that this is the picture that I obtain when I tropicalize a plain quarter. Sorry, I should be more precise. It's not the same picture. It depends on the quartic, of course. It's just an example. It's one case, yeah? It's a, you give me one particular plain quartic, I throw it into my tropicalization procedure and I obtain this picture, yeah? One possible outcome. Okay, why is tropical uh, geometry a useful tool for counting problems? Like for example, our count of bitangents. Again, a little bit of history to make uh, this point of view clear somehow. So um, Michalke proved this correspondence theory that counts, that proves an equality of counts of complex or real plane curves of fixed genus and a fixed degree that satisfy point conditions. And he proved that those numbers can be obtained by just counting tropical curves. I'll show you a picture of this in a second. You could then use this to actually give asymptotic statements about Valjongi invariants. So Valjongi invariants are put roughly counts of real curves. Tropical geometry also show up in mirror symmetry in which such enumerative numbers, such counting problems also play a role. So this goes back to or across Seabird, they have a big program on mirror symmetry. Also many others uh, have uh, results in that direction. The arithmetic is sorry, the asymptotic statements I mentioned before, I didn't say that I should by Edenberg, Kalamov and Schustin. And also we have correspondence theorems for Horvitz numbers. So Horvitz numbers are yet again, another case of such a counting problem where this time I count covers of algebraic curves. And you can show that also those Hurwitz numbers you can compute by tropical methods by counting tropical covers. And you can then use this tropical perspective to prove new wall crossing formulas for double Hurwitz numbers. So what I want you to take away from this slide essentially is just tropical geometry can be used for counting problems. You always have these correspondence theorems that somehow tell you how to count on the tropical side. And then you can use the tropical side to gain new insights on the algebraic side. For example, asymptotic statements or wall crossing formulas. You can get new information about algebraic geometry by making use of tropical geometry. That's uh, the point to take away from this slide. And this is the example I promised about counting cubics. So this is a picture of the count of rational cubics through eight points. I don't know if that's something you've seen before, but uh, there are 12 complex uh, cubics, rational cubics, sorry, rational cubics through eight points. Um, and the Valjongé invariant, which I said roughly, you can view this as a real count, is eight. And the tropical count gives us both Simultaneously, how does that work? Well, first of all, I fix eight points. So those points that you see, they are supposed to be copies of the same eight points. Yeah? And then I've drawn nine tropical curves, nine tropical cubics, uh, nine tropical cubics. Again, those pictures look a lot like the picture we've seen before. What you recognize, of course, is I have three ends in the special directions now, which is very nice because our, our cubic meets a line in three points after Bizu's theorem. And we know that those ends correspond to the intersections with the coordinate line. Also, you see that those pictures are rational. So we don't see any genus. Here, this is obvious. Here, this is maybe not so obvious because that looks like it could be a cycle, but it's actually not. You should view this as a crossing of two edges. This edge only crosses over the edge, and then it's actually a rational curve. So this picture shows nine tropical cubics, but something that you always have to do in tropical geometry is you count with multiplicity. And the multiplicity reflects how many objects degenerate to your one, um, to your one tropical object. Remember, tropical geometry, I want to view it as a degeneration that takes algebraic curves, tropicalizes them, and produces tropical curves. 
And this tropicalization map is by no means injective. And in this counting problem, multiple algebraic curves that I want to count go to the same tropical curve. And this is true in particular for this last picture here. This last guy has a non-trivial multiplicity, which is four. All the others have multiplicity one. Yeah, I won't write it down. And this is the complex multiplicity now. Now I have eight guys that have a one and one guy that has a four. And if you sum this up, you obtain your 12, which is the complex count. On the other hand, the real multiplicity, real, let me use blue for real. The real multiplicity of this curve is just zero and all the others yet again are one. So the real count is eight times one plus one times zero, which is eight, which is the Valdorje invariant that I expected. Yeah? So you can see that I just need one picture to produce both counts, the real count and the tropical count. And that's something uh, that's a very nice feature of tropical geometry that it sort of helps you to simultaneously count no matter what your field is. And that is precisely the point I want to make with this talk, but I want to actually showcase it in more details with this case of bitangents, with this bitangent count problem. Okay, so let's move on to bitangents to tropical quartics. Remember, we already talked about a plane quartic over the complex numbers has 28 bitangents. So there's actually a complex missing here. Sorry about that. A complex or, you know, algebraically closed plane quartic has 28 bitangents. Now it turns out that if you consider a tropical plane quartic, like the picture I've shown you before, it may have infinitely many bitangents. So that's a bit sad because how are we going to recover the count? But it turns out there's a very natural equivalence relation um, where we identify two tropical bitangents if we can continuously move one to the other while bitaining the bitangency. I want to show you an example for this and also an example of what a tropical bitangent is at all. This I also have to introduce intersection multiplicity in the tropical world. So the intersection multiplicity of a point is the absolute value of the determinant of the direction vectors if we're talking about a transitive intersection like this. So this is just a point where two edges meet. Those two edges have some, they, yeah, they, they, they point in some directions. This is horizontal. So the direction vector is one zero as written there. And this, well, you have to believe it, but this has direction minus one, two. So I just write those two vectors into my matrix. Um, I'd have to do it right. Sorry, that was wrong. Um, one, zero it is. Okay. And then I compute the absolute value of the determinant and I obtain two. So by definition of intersection multiplicity, this point here is a point of intersection multiplicity too, this guy here. So it is a tangency, it's a tangent point. Okay, I claim that this red line is a bitangent. I should have told you this gray picture is of course the tropicalized quartic that we looked at before. I hope you remember this gray picture is the tropicalized quartic. The red guy I claim is a tropical bitangent. Of course, it looks like a tropical line. We discussed tropical lines before, so that's good. Now we figured out already it has one point of tangency. What about the other intersection? The other intersection is along a whole segment. So this little circle here, it's, uh, it's, the details can be viewed here. It's a whole segment of intersection. How do you determine the multiplicity of a segment of intersection? You do something which is called a stable intersection. You take your red line, move it a little bit away, that's the upper picture. Then you have two points of intersection. Then you can make this determinant computation for both points. So what, what would we have here? This is a diagonal, so one, one, and the other is uh, zero, one. So that's a one, right? And here we have uh, the determinant of one, zero, zero, one. So that's also one. So we have two points of multiplicity one, we move it now back 
Yeah, and then we obtain here those two points, which are called the stable intersection. They both have intersection multiplicity one. And altogether, the segment has intersection multiplicity one plus one, which is two. And multiplicity two is a tangent, of course. We view this as a tangent. So the segment of intersection is also a tropical tangency point. And now we convinced ourselves that this red line is indeed a tropical bitangent line to this black tropicalized quartic that we look at. And in this picture, you can now already also see this thing with the continuous moving, because you can see that I can take this red line and move its vertex upwards. If I do this, what will happen? Well, this tangency will stay exactly as it is. I didn't touch it, right? And that tangency point, I just moved it a little bit over there, but it's still the same type of tangency, so to say. It's still just two edges that meet, and it's the same two edges, so they have the same intersection multiplicity, so it's still a tangent, yeah? <clears throat> and I can play this game until I hit this vertex. I can move until here. I can produce a family of lines, infinitely many tropical bitangents, right? I cannot move further, right? Because now instead of having one point of intersection multiplicity two, I have two of intersection multiplicity one. That was too much, that I shouldn't do. But I can move as much up. And of course I can also move down yeah? until I hit this vertex. And so now you see this infinite family of tropical bitangents, which I can identify using the equivalence relation before. And um, I want to uh, point you to a fact, how you can think of this picture in a nice way. What we like to do when we discuss tropical bitangents is to always mark the vertex of the bitangent line. And then what you obtain is sort of an interval of possible vertices. Yeah, this, this, this pink thing that I've drawn, you should view of this, you should view this as a line segment in the plane, a line segment worth of vertices of tropical bitangent classes. And this line segment is what we would call a bitangent class. Yeah, because it, it coins, it, it merges all those tropical bitangents that are equivalent in my definition of equivalence. And this is precisely that picture. Now you see it in red. That's this, what used to be pink line segment that you can view as a bitangent class, infinitely many tropical bitangents, but they are all equivalent. So I want to identify them. Okay, and just to give you a preview of the kind of lifting results we are discussing, so we ask ourselves, you know, if there are infinitely many bitangent lines, they cannot all be tropicalizations of bitangents, right? It's like tropicalization, you can view it as a sort of shadow, yeah? It's also possible that in a shadow, you see something as if it intersects, but actually the, the two things that throw the shadow, they do not intersect. It just looks like that in the shadow, right? And that's um, a, something that is happening here also. We have those fake bitangent lines, tropical bitangent lines, which look like tropical bitangents, but they are not coming from bitangents. They are not tropicalizations of bitangents, right? They, they can't be, because we don't have so many bitangent lines in the algebraic world. We only have 28 yeah? in the, over the complex numbers. So what, what are the ones of, in my equivalence class here, which are the ones that actually come from bitangent lines that are tropicalizations of bitangent lines? And the answer is this vertex is the tropicalization of two bitangent lines. And this vertex is the tropicalization of two bitangent lines and nobody in the interior is. Yeah, so if we take a polynomial over the field of preserved series, or you know, you can just as before think a family of complex curves such that the tropicalization of this family or of quartic curves is this gray picture here, then exactly two of the 28 bitangent lines will tropicalize here to the tropical line with the vertex being here, two will tropicalize to the tropical line with the vertex being here. 
and no body to the interior. Just a preview of the kind of lifting results we're going to discuss. Okay, let's sum up again where we are. Our plane quartic has 28, our complex plane quartic has 28 by tangents, as we know from Plücker. A tropical plane quartic may have infinitely many, but we can identify them by continuously moving while maintaining the bitangency. If we do that and discuss equivalence classes of tropical bitangent lines, then Baker, Len, Morrison, Flüger, and Wren tell us that a tropical quartic will have seven bitangent classes. Now we're quite tempted to assume that each of those seven bitangent classes should have four lifts over the complex numbers because then seven times four is our 28 as expected. And in the picture before, this is actually the case. This is one by a tangent class. This point has two lifts. This point has two lifts. So altogether, I have four lifts. I have four algebraic complex by tangents that tropicalize to this one by tangent class. And uh, this is actually true. It's a fact. It was shown for the case when the skeleton is a complete K4, it's a complete graph on four vertices by Chan and Yiradi Lok. And uh, it was shown for generic smooth tropical cortex in R2 by Joaf Len and myself. Here's an example. This is the, the gray thing is the tropical cortex we discussed before. And the red things are the seven tropical by tangent classes. And you can see they look very different. This is the one we discussed before, this line segment we discussed. And it uh, has four lifts altogether. Those numbers you should always view as the lifting multiplicities, meaning um, the, first, the numbers are associated to vertices here, right? So it's only the vertices that have lifts that come from honest by tangents that are not wrong shadows, right? And uh, there's two tropic, there's two algebraic bitangents that tropicalize here. I think, what's the skeleton of the quartic? Good question. Thank you. Um, that is the part without the ends. And I also remove leaf edges uh, one after the other. So for my picture, the skeleton would be this here. Yeah. Okay, but um, you know, it's the if you don't know details about skeleta or complete graphs or anything, doesn't matter. You can just read the slide before as it was proved in some special case and in some different case, which is more generic. Um, but it's proved in any case. Every smooth tropical quartic has twenty-eight lifts somehow for the bitangents. Yeah, sure, no problem. Right, so this segment has four lifts. This bitangent class is just a point, and you can see why actually, right? Because you can see what, what vertex, sorry, what bitangent line does it describe? We view it as the vertex of a tropical line. So the tropical line is this here, and it has two such intersections, which are intersections with a segment of which we know that they have multiplicity too, so that's fine. But it's also clear that we cannot move this line. Yeah? As soon as we try to move it somewhere, we lose one tangency at least, if not both. So this is uh, the equivalence class is just a point. It's fixed. But this point has four lifts. Here, this is now a two-dimensional bitangent class. Yeah? Yet again, let me sketch some of the bitangent lines that are uh, hidden in here. Yeah? So this line is a bitangent, for example. This line is a bitangent. These are now tangency points similar to the one we discussed before here on the right. Yeah, so all kinds of tropical bitangent lines in here. Yeah, and the statement is only the vertices lift, and then there's precisely one complex bitangent that tropicalizes to those. Okay, so just that you see a complete picture of seven tropical bitangent classes and therefore lifts over the complex numbers. Yeah, I don't want to frighten you with this slide, but I just want to give you a glimpse of the complete combinatorial classification. So if you want to try to understand how tropical bitangent classes can look like, 
you will come to this result. So this is a result that I obtained with ng equator here. There are 41 different shapes up to symmetry. Um, and these colors, they have a meeting. The black cells are not part of the curve. The red parts lie on the curve. You can see that in the picture before, it's possible that a bitangent shape meets the curve like here. And then we will draw this in, in red in the next picture. And this we would draw in, in black. Yeah? Um, and then the white points are vertices of the curve. And the black numbers are always the lifting multiplicities over the complex numbers only. I'm still only over the complex numbers right now. This is where the complex uh, bitangents tropicalize to. Okay, just to give you an idea of how the complete combinatorial classification looks like. Now, some results. So as I said already with you of Len, we proved that if you take a tropical bitangent of a generic smooth tropical quartic, it will have four complex lift. Then with ng equator, I discussed the real situation. So what happens if we're not working over the complex numbers, but over the reals? It turns out that then every bitangent class can have either zero or four real lifts. So either everybody is already real or nobody is real of my four complex lifts that I have. Yeah, remember I always have four complex lifts. They can be real or not. And it turns out that they are either all real or none, either simultaneously or not. And another thing which is nice to observe is that real implies totally real in the tropical world. If you have a lift which is real, then it is already totally real. And the strategy how we prove that is using a combinatorial classification, like you've seen that classification before that picture, and then local lifting computations. Now, what about other fields? I promised that tropical geometry is very powerful because you can use it simultaneously over any other field. And that's actually true. So together with Sam Payne and Chris Shaw, we generalize to any algebraically closed field. And the four lifts will be true over any algebraically closed field. Um, and then if we take a field of characteristic not equal to two, then it's true that we'll ha have either zero or four lifts. Yeah, so this, this real statement can be generalized to fields of characteristic not equal to two. What is nice is that all lifts actually live in a quadratic field extension. Yeah, R over C, for the R contained in C, of course, is a quadratic field extension. We know that C is just R adjoined the um, imaginary unit, I. Um, and this is, some, this is some general behavior. If you pick some other field and uh, you don't find the bitangents or not, you don't find all 28 bitangents, you don't have all your lists, you can take a quadratic field extension and you will get all of them. Um, if square root of two and square root of three, three exist in your field, then we also have the analog of the totally real statement. Square root of two and square root of three, of course, exist in the real numbers. So that satisfies this condition. And the statement is all lifts which exist over K, all bitangent lines, which are defined over K, also have their tangency points over K. Yeah, if, you're, if, if the bitangent line is already real, also, the tangent point is already real, so you're totally real. Yeah, so this is the generalization of the real implies totally real statement we're talking here about. So there are generalizations over other fields. That's the message you can take away from these slides. There are lifting results over other fields. There are, of course, still many questions which remain. For example, we know that there exists real quartics that have real but not totally real by tangents. What is happening to those when you tropicalize? Well, they will tropicalize to something non-smooth. So Lee and Len have worked on this, but there are still questions to be answered. Then also, you know, we know that every by tangent class now has either zero or four lifts over the reals. Let's go back to that one complete example we discussed. So each of those has either zero or four. So in total, we get a number which is divisible by four, but it's not at all clear from that statement why we only get four, eight, 16, or 28 altogether, which we should expect by Pluca's statement. 
because over the reals, we can only have four, eight, 16, or 28 real by tangents, right? And this is something that has been shown by my student, Alhai Desgaiga um, and uh, Marta Panitsut. They did actually our computer search on using the secondary fan of Cortex, and they proved that in total, you actually only get those numbers that you expect. And then a, a question maybe from the experts more. Um, of course, R2 is a naive choice of a tropical plane. You could choose to work on other tropical planes. Can you say anything about bitangents of tropical cortex on other models of a tropical plane? So yet uh, there are still many questions which are open. Ah, let's discuss another connection to the real world. If we discuss a real quartic, like this gray four ovals that we saw before as a sketch, then there's something which is called the avoidance locus. And the avoidance locus is a subset of the dual plane containing all the lines that do not meet the real part, like this red line. This red line does not meet the real part of my quartic. Uh, now there's a statement going back to Kuma and Vinikov that each of the seven, uh, the, first of all, the avoidance locus has seven connected components. And it turns out that each of these seven connected components contains precisely four by tangents in its closure. So in my example, you can see that really nice. Let's take this red line and move it a little bit here and there, right? then it's still going to be in the same connected component of the avoidance locus, no matter how I move, right? And then if I can, if I move it here to the very, oh, sorry, that was too much. If I move it to the very right, yeah, then it actually touches two overs and that's one by tangent, yeah? And on the right, you see precisely those four by tangents, which are in the closure of the connected component corresponding to this red line of the avoidance locus. Okay, and it turns out that a tropical by tangent class, which does lift to the reals, yeah, you remember the zero or four statement, zero, you don't lift to the reals, four, you completely lift to the reals. If you have four real lifts, then you are the tropicalization of a connected component of the avoidance locus. That is sort of nice. Also, it gives some deeper explanation of why those tropical by tangent classes are actually all tropically convex. And a nice corollary is, you know, this avoidance locus somehow gives us a way to group by tangents into packages of four. And tropical geometry, of course, also gives us a way to group by tangents into packages of four using equivalence classes. And tropical grouping and real grouping coincides. But it's interesting to observe that the tropical grouping exists, of course, independently of the field. Yeah, the avoidance locus was a very real thing. Yeah, so the tropical uh, geometry gives us a way to group here that is meaningful over every field and that coincides with the avoidance locus gr grouping over the real numbers, which is kind of nice, I think. Okay, so now let's turn to arithmetic counts. Um, I want you to think of arithmetic counts as a way of counting over, count, simultaneously counting over different fields. We'll make this more precise in a bit. Or maybe not so precise, but uh, yeah, we'll get, we'll say more about it. Simultaneously counting over different fields. Um, but I have to tell you that you shouldn't view counting too seriously here. We're not just counting one, another one is two, another one is three. That's not what we are doing. We take our geometric objects and we associate an element in the so-called Grotendieck Wittring to our element. And then we add elements in the Grotendieck Wittring. Then our count is something is yet again, an element in Grotendieck Witt. And then we can specialize fields and interesting things will happen. Okay, before we make this more precise, what is Grotendieck Witt at all? The Grotendieck Witt ring is generated by, or it contains all formal sums of isomorphism classes of quadratic forms V times V to K over K. So V is some vector space over K. So you can just think matrices, right? A matrix, formal sums of matrices somehow. 
matrices because I can take X times A, X transpose times A times X, and this will be a quadratic, sorry, not times the same X times Y, right? Sorry, yeah. So I send X, Y to this, and this is a quadratic form, uh, yeah, for, for, my, my, for my vector space here, yeah? The quadratic form is defined by the matrix. That's what I want to say. But now I take isomorphism classes. So some matrices are going to be equivalent. And for example, this matrix that has a one and a minus one on the diagonal is equivalent to the matrix with just two ones when I work over the complex numbers, because then I have these base change matrices, one, zero, zero, I, with which I can base change the uh, quadratic form, and I can map one matrix to the other like that. But you see, of course, that I needed the imaginary unit, I, in my base change matrix. So that's something that I have over the complex numbers, but I don't have over the real. So over the real numbers, those two matrices are different. So the point of this example is just to show you that Grotendieck Wittrings depend on the field we're working with. They're going to be different depending on what field you pick. Okay, and arithmetic counts, as I say, we associate an element in such a quoten dequitring to our geometric objects, and they have been studied in various uh, situations. There exist arithmetic counts of lines in cubic surfaces by Kasse and Wickelgren. There exist arithmetic counts of plane curves satisfying point conditions like those 12 rational cubics, complex rational cubics we discussed before by Mark Levin. And there also exists an arithmetic count of bitangents of a quartic by Larsen and Vogt. And I hope that the example we discussed earlier already shows you that if we now go and specialize for K, the field of complex numbers, then it somehow is only the size of the matrix that plays a role, yeah? Because I can always produce ones on the diagonal if I'm in the complex world. And in that sense, specializing to the complex numbers will always give me an honest number, like I'm used to counting my complex geometric objects. But if, if I insert the real numbers, then I actually get other meaningful real invariants. For example, this Valdorje invariants that we discussed earlier, the count of real cubics where we said that it's uh, uh, roughly eight. And tropical geometry has uh, some intermediary role, of course. I showed you already in this example of cubics that you can use one and the same tropical count to produce both this Vangelje invariant eight for cubics and the complex count of cubics, which is 12. And uh, so we studied the tropical situation for bitangents to quartics. Uh, we meaning, uh, yet again, Sam Payne and Chris Shaw. And what we can say is that the element in Groten die Gewitt that belongs to the four bitangents in a tropical equivalence class, you can completely determine it with tropical method. And you only need to know the initials of the coefficients of your quartic. This is a statement that makes sense for those of you who are familiar with the previous series. For the others, you just think that you need to know the start of the family somehow. You need to know the dominating coefficient of your family when you, when you make the shrinking process to, to get to the tropical world. Essentially, what I'm saying is you don't need to know much. Yeah, You, you, you don't need to know so much about your family of quartics. Uh, that you're tropicalizing only a little. And the nice thing is that for many, many tropical bitangent classes, you can just express this element in Groten die Gewitt very easily as two times H, where H is the so-called hyperbolic form, and it belongs to the matrix we discussed before that has one and minus one on the diagonal. Yeah, so for many, many tropical bitangents, I just get two times h. Um, and this is, as I say, this is true for many, but not for all. And that's yet again, something that I find very interesting and where I think that not all is said so far, there has to be some reason why that works for almost everyone, but not quite all. So there's something to be figured out here. Yeah, and I want to end with an example. This is a picture that we saw before. It's the tropicalized quartic, the gray thing that we discussed all the time. 
And in red, we have the seven bitangent classes that we also already discussed before, with those numbers being the complex lifting numbers. And I want to end by telling you that you can produce an arithmetic count for this uh, tropicalized quartic, and it will always be 14 times this hyperbolic form. So you can really use tropical geometry nicely to produce those elements in Grotendieck with those arithmetic counts, which you can view as a simultaneous count over any field. So tropical geometry is a really nice tool for simultaneous counting over every field. Yeah, okay, so thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks a lot, Hannah, for this nice talk. Uh, Thank you. I have a minor question. So uh, how, we, how do you associate a bitangent to a hyperbolic form uh, so that you can count there are 14 of them? Um, you, uh, you associate this, okay, this is a not so easy, that question. Um, what you're asking is for a given by tangent, how do I associate an element in Grotendieck with, right? Yes. And uh, I, th that's a formula for that. But I also, I want to refer you to the paper by Larsen and Vogt, where you can read about that if you need more details. Very roughly, what you do is uh, you take the element in Grotendieck with, which is given, so you take a one dimensional, uh, sorry, you take a size one matrix, um, at the size one matrix, just a number. And the number you take is, uh, you take the polynomial that defines your quartic, derive it with respect to the line you're discussing, insert one tangency point, and then times the same thing with the other tangency point. So that's going to be a number. And this, and this is, a, you view it as a size one matrix, and then you take this element in Grotendieck Witt. And uh, this is how you associate an element in Grotendieck Witt. And now you wonder, of course, I told you I'm, it's a number. How do I ever get this hyperbolic form? Well, I, I, this was a, a bit of a lie when I said you just take the, the size one matrix and the number, because that number could be a complex number, right? But when we work over the reals, then we want to view the complex numbers as r to the two. And then we view multiplication with this number as a quadratic form on r2. And in this way, we can produce this hyperbolic uh, form. Okay. Did, did that help? It's yeah, a, yeah. A, a, only a short answer, sorry, but uh, it's really, uh, it's a bit, too long to give a good answer. Uh, okay. But yeah, let, let me refer you to the paper of Larsen and Vogt. There you see all the details. And uh, yeah, of course, we can discuss further if you have questions. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Sure. Uh, so the continuation of the previous question. So in the previous slide, when, you, when your field is uh, the complex numbers, uh, the earlier one, what is the quadratic form uh, you assign to get the yeah, number? Then, yeah, yeah. Then, so, so you have to know more about Grotendieck to really make sense of that. But uh, let me put it roughly like this. You know, 14 times h means that I have 14 times, it's a formal sum, yeah? I have 14 times this, this matrix 1, 0, 0, minus 1. But over the complex numbers, this is equivalent to 1, 0, 0, 1. And that I can view as one plus one in Grotendieck with, okay? Because I just take the block decomposition of my matrix. And in that sense, my 14 times this becomes just 28 when viewed yeah. over the complex numbers. Right. Yeah, does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So yeah. Uh, know, maybe one I'm thing gonna... I should say, over the reals, there's a signed count of uh, bitangents. And this fact that this is 14 times h, means that if you count the bitangents with a sign, you actually get zero. And the sign is something I can explain very easily because with, so you view your quartic with respect to the line at infinity. And with respect to that, a bitangent can either look like this or like this. And this has sign minus one and this has sign one. Yeah, and if you, you can produce a sign count like this, this is again, this is from Larsen and Fogt. They discussed this. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I have another question. 
So mm -hmm. uh, in this picture, so this red line, if the red line uh, intersect or uh, tangent to a vertex, then how do I do this uh, stable intersection? Because I have two choices. Uh, I'm not quite sure which red line you mean. Could you? Uh, so try I'm saying to... that uh, the quad, uh, if, if the if the line is tangent to the quadric at a vertex. At a vertex. Okay. Okay. Sure. So you mean? Let me try to draw this. You mean, for example, this? Yeah. Right. Right. And yeah, the, it's uh, sort of the same recipe. We take the line, move it a little bit away. Um, like this, or maybe, maybe, sorry, maybe I should move it somewhere else to make it more obvious. Yeah, doesn't work. Oh, sorry. No, yeah, anyway, it's better that this one has gone too, because then I can draw it better. Okay. Um, uh, like this, right? Now yeah. you can see three intersection points. Right. And we can compute these determinants. This will have multiplicity one. This will also have multiplicity one and this will have multiplicity two. And now we move this thing to where, where we wanted to see it earlier. And then we'll have together intersection multiplicity four for the whole segment. Yeah, and that's okay. also a bi-tangent then. So the total four multiplicity is also allowed. Yeah. yeah, that's also allowed to have one intersection component, a segment then that has intersection multiplicity two is also allowed. Yeah. Okay. For example, also um, there's this pretty, I mean, I, you, you would probably know the honeycomb quartic, do you? Yes. Yes, great. So let me try to sketch it quickly. The honeycomb quartic also has a, oopsie, that went wrong, has also a very nice bitangent of intersect of uh, yeah intersection multiplicity for so okay this is the skeleton of the honeycomb quartic um, maybe I should add raise quickly okay and now this bitangent line is also intersection multiplicity for. And you can see it if you move it a little bit, you have four points of intersection multiplicity one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, can I ask one more question? <clears throat> so, uh, if I want to think of as rational quartic and I want to count uh, rational quartic with um, by byte tangent. So I can also think of it as a uh, quartic with three nodes, right? Um, so in that, yes, yes. In that case, uh, uh, we will encounter some excess intersection, right? Uh, is that correct? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, that's certainly true. I have to admit that I never thought about this. I always only looked at bitangents to smooth quartics. So I have okay. no idea. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. You should certainly expect some degenerate behavior. But yeah, sorry, I don't know more about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good thank question. You. Thank you. Hello. So um, my question is that uh, in counting these tropical bitangents, uh, why are you not uh, rotating? Uh, the uh, tropical line that you are uh, looking uh, like, yeah. Why not then, rotating? Yeah, there may be, I mean, this is not the only tropical line, correct? So, you mean like this? Yes, yeah, this. Yeah. I see, I see. Oh, maybe I should have said that. This is a min picture, but I work in, in Max. And so for me, all tropical lines look like this. Yeah, so they are shifted around, but they always have those three rays in those directions. If you saw pictures like this, they are completely valid, of course, but it's just a different convention that people use. It's the min convention. Sorry. Uh, does that does that answer the question? I'm not sure. I, I mean, uh, I, so okay, so you can actually 
start with uh, a different uh, different initial polynomial to get uh, a different looking yes. line right so yes yeah i mean but there will I, always be shifts of that picture that i showed you a line is always uh, so in the max convention a tropical line is always something that has a vertex and then three rays in those three special directions and that is because the the rays are coming from the intersections with the coordinate lines and in particular the direction is because yeah the direction here is minus 1 0 because i have a point that uh, that tends to minus infinity something in the amoeba yeah Okay. So, so all tropical lines look like this. They're just shifted. Unless you use a different convention, then they are reflected in them. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in the correspondence, uh, where you go from algebraic curves to the tropical curves mm -hmm. uh, by constructing the amoeba and then shrinking it. So, mm -hmm. um, so you said that it is not one-to-one. -one. So my question is that... Uh, uh, so these tropical curves, they may have multiple, uh, I mean, non-zero multiplicities. So is that the only obstruction to the, to that map being not one-to-one? -one? Um, no, so um, th this map is really terribly not one-to-one, -one, you could say. So are you familiar with the point of view of uh, using a non archimedean valued field for tropicalization, or you rather like the uh, amoeba shrinking point of view? Yeah, I mean, either case is fine. Either case is fine, because with the valuation, it's so much easier to say, to, to make this precise somehow, because you, so if you take a polynomial over a non archimedean valued field, then all you need to know about the coefficients of your polynomial to understand the tropicalization is the valuation. But there are tons of elements in your field that have the same valuation, of course. So it's really a terribly non-injective map. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I, uh, yeah, another question. So uh, could you elaborate on the shrinking process? I mean, what sort of, what steps are involved? I mean, is it, uh, I mean, is it is it as simple as uh, you know, uh, literally uh, shrinking that uh, amoeba to? I mean, I mean, uh, yeah. Does the stru yeah, structure yeah. of the amoeba mm -hmm. always reflect the structure of the tropical curve that you get? Is what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. So, so topologically, it really is just that, just shrinking. Um, but to make it precise, it's really this line somehow that says what I mean. Uh, with this shrinking, actually, I take a limit where t goes to infinity of log to the base t of v of ft, where ft is a family of um, of polynomials, and then it depends on the family how this will will really look like. Yeah. All right. Okay. So the, the, I hope. Yeah. The, I think that's all I can say about this. Yeah. But you can view it really topologically, like in this example. It really is such a shrinking procedure. Procedure. So there are, um, there, there are, for example, also nice pictures of amoebas of a cubic, and uh, they kind of look like this. And then they have this hole, yeah? And this will end up being the cycle of a tropical cubic, smooth cubic, of course, yeah. But it's actually not so easy to compute those amoebas. It's a lot easier to, if you want to compute, it's a lot easier to take the perspective of a field with a non archimedean valuation and use valuation than you can honestly compute. Okay, thank you. Sure. I have a minor question. Uh, so uh, if you uh, look at the tropical curve uh, and if you look at this region in this figure, so if you take the asymptotes, you basically end up asymptotic rays, you end up the with the tropical curve. Now, yeah. uh, is it the case that when you just get hold of the asymptotic rays, you can generate the line segments, which are the uh, non-infinity rays inside the tropical curve just out of this information? I see. Um, I don't think so. 
Um, not in general. So, but you, so you're absolutely right. If we just so, so if if you give me a cortic and I just study what are the intersections of my cortic with the coordinate axis, I will know about those infinite rays, right? I will know about the infinite rays. But then I think that's still not enough to complete the picture. Um, the combinatorics is just too big for that. There, there will be multiple, there will at least be cases where you have multiple options to complete the picture. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, just a confirmation. So, uh, so, I mean, when do we say a line is not a tangent to the curve? Uh, so is it uh, when the intersection multiplicity is zero? Or, no, or not zero, I, but it's, yeah. Let me show you a line, which is not perfect question. I should have drawn a line, which is not a bad tangent. Oopsie, that, imagine this is horizontal, okay? Like for example, this line, there's Bizu theorem also in the tropical world. So a line is supposed to meet the quartic in four points counted with multiplicity. Yeah, so here we have four single points. Yeah, and the line then becomes a tangent if those four points merge to be two points of intersection multiplicity two, yeah? And that is totally analogous to um, the classical picture where a general line meets my quartic in four points with Bezu's theory of intersection multiplicity one. But then when two pairs of those points merge to become two tangency points, then I have a bitangent. Okay, thanks. Sure. Uh, any more questions from the online audience? Uh, you can unmute yourself. Uh, so, uh, will you please uh, remark so that uh, rational cubic in that in that picture you drawn eight pictures and you said that last one contributes four so why is it uh, sorry this here yeah so the last one is con contributing mm -hmm. four so uh, is there any uh, argument on that yeah um there's a, a complicated and a more easy argument the complicated argument is so there's a way to think about that yeah and the, this is, as I said, the tropicalization map is highly non-injective. And uh, so what I do is I have a fixed points and I have 12 cubics that in the algebraic world, yeah, that go through the points. And now yes. I tropicalize those 12 cubics. And it turns out that four of those 12 cubics will tropicalize to the same picture to this. This is why we have the four, yeah? Of oh. course, you might ask why, and this is totally non-obvious. Um, this is where it's getting really complicated. So this is at the heart of Mihalkin's correspondence theory, which uh, is a 2005 paper, which uh, appeared in, in uh, GEMS and uh, I don't know, it has at least 50 pages. So it's, it's really deep, yeah? I'm, I'm not exaggerating here. But the good thing is that Mihalkin gave us a combinatorial way to compute this form. So I don't need to know about the lifts in the complex world, which is quite difficult to understand those lifts, right? But he gives us a combinatorial way to do that. And um, to really explain that, it's easiest to turn over to the dual world. Are you familiar with dual Newton subdivisions? Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Then I will just draw you a dual picture of this cubic, and you will immediately understand this four from a combinatorial point of view. So this is the Newton polygon, yeah? Yes. And yes. now we'll draw the subdivision which is dual to this particular cubic here. Um, yeah, it looks like this. And it has two big triangles, those two guys. And the areas, the normalized area of those two triangles is two each. And so what we do is we take the product of the normalized areas of the triangles in our Newton subdivision. And that is the multiplicity with which we have to count. So yeah. for me, this is two times two times a bunch of ones, right? Which is four. 
Yeah. And this is the multiplicity, the complex multiplicity of my curve. And this, as I said, is due to Michalik. Yeah. My correspondence theory. Really nice result, of course. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I had a small question. So mm -hmm. uh, in the example that you showed at the end, so in that one, if I just consider like those uh, uh, points, which are like honest, uh, honest by tangents, those fat ones. Yeah. In this the one. ones that actually come from. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Like mm -hmm. the word, mm -hmm. so that would give me like a tropical line arrangement <laughs> if I consider all of them. So, Absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. So does that encode any like information like out of all like all possible tropical line arrangements, which one can occur from like a smooth plane quartic and uh, like we can also look at the dual subdivisions. So is that mm -hmm. known or like in some proof techniques? No, nothing is known. That's a really beautiful question. I like it. Uh, maybe you should work on that, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> you are the expert of line arrangements. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I don't so know. I have no idea. I mean, that's an obvious way to try to attack this question. And yeah. the Alhaidis Geiges and Mata Panizut's tool would mm -hmm. help, right? As I said, yeah, yeah. they go over the whole secondary fan of cortex mm -hmm. and they would compute all the tropical bitangents for you. So you could mm -hmm. just sort of list all line arrangements that come from smooth cortex yeah. and yeah. study their properties. It's of course, yeah. it's a big task because there are many, many yeah. codes, but yeah, one could just um, try but, uh, it, like, start with a few examples. If I remember, you have a complete classification of all these uh, bitangent classes, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, but the classification of the shapes of the bitangent classes is not sufficient for you here if you want to study the line arrangement. So this picture is not sufficient because you need to know how they interact, right? Yeah. There's going, yeah. going to be yeah. seven of those in, in yeah. one, yeah? There's going to mm -hmm. be seven of those. And you need to know to understand the line arrangement. Yeah, you okay. need to know how which ones are these, Yeah, and this is as I say, you can for concrete cases, you can just mm -hmm. compute this with Matas and Alhaidis tools. So it would be super easy to produce a, a bunch of examples to get started. Mm -hmm. And yep. uh, yeah, and then you could try to develop conjectures. It's a it's a cute question. I like it. Yeah, it's a very very nice question. You you should Thanks. study. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. <laughs> Good. So, any more questions from the online audience? They can you can put your questions on the chat. Okay, so that doesn't seem to be the case. So, th thanks once again, Anna, for such a nice talk. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for your attention. Okay, have a nice conference.